So, following on from free oscillations, we can have forced oscillations. This is where you're adding energy into the system, and, and this will affect either the frequency of the oscillation or the size of the oscillation. You know, the first example might be, rather than someone being allowed to swing freely on a swing, someone comes along that you know that you have to push them exactly, exactly the right time to get large amplitude swings, and we'll come back to that in a second. Another way of demonstrating forced oscillations, which is what we'd use in a laboratory and what would show up in exam questions quite often, is a setup something like this, where we've got a signal generator that produces an alternating potential difference, and you can choose the rate of that, connected to a vibration generator, which you've seen before. You've seen those when you're doing standing waves, but this time it's held upside down, supporting a spring with a mass on the end of it. And you driving frequency. And this driving frequency is force, forcing this to vibrate. Now, most of the time, patience, because the energy that you provide to the system just tends to dissipate. Now, that's not that obvious here, but it's probably more obvious if we use the swing as an example. You're only going to get large swings if you nudge that swing at just the right time. Basically, you give the swing a push just at the top of each oscillation. If you pushed at the wrong time, you're effectively working against it. If you pushed early as the person approaches the pusher, um, the energy that you introduce to the system is just being used to slow them down. So it basically dissipates. Unless you provide the push at just the right time. Now that can be demonstrated here. Uh, what happens is that as we change the frequency on the signal generator, these oscillations don't do much at all until the driving frequency gets close to the natural frequency of this system. And when that happens, it effectively just nudges it at the right time. And you get the maximum energy transfer and you get very big amplitude oscillations. And this is given a name. This is called resonance. So I've written this down here because this is a standard thing that you're going to need to learn. Resonance is when the driving frequency, so that in this case is provided by the signal generator, or in this case provided by the person pushing the other one on the switch. When that driving frequency is close to the natural frequency, you get a maximum energy transfer, and that increases the amplitude of the oscillations. And in the context of questions that you might get, you then have to go on and identify what that could do. It could cause damage, or it could cause some other problems. So, I've got some examples of this. So I'm just going to change my piece of paper, you bear with me. So, resonance. What happens if the driving frequency is close to the natural frequency? So I've got a few different... So in a washing machine, you've probably noticed that at some point during the cycle, they can get very noisy. They can start rattling an awful lot. Well, why is that? Well, it'll be because the frequency of the motor that's spinning the drum, and probably due to sort of the weight of the clothes over to one side in the drum, provides a driving frequency. Driving frequency gets close to the natural frequency of the washing machine. We get a maximum energy transfer. We get an increased amplitude. And, well, in this case, it doesn't really cause damage, but it creates irritation, it creates a lot of noise, and I guess potentially it could cause damage. The next example here... Well, this is supposed to be the Millennium Bridge, formerly known as the Wobbly Bridge. And this is the bridge that joins Modern and St Paul's. And you might be a little bit young to know about this, but when this bridge opened, there was a massive scandal. Because it was a, it was a big deal that this was opening in the year 2000. It opened for one day. 
As people walked across the bridge, the crowds were so big that all the people were forced to walk in step with each other, shuffling along. And this stepping that they did ended up being at the, very close to the natural frequency of the bridge. So, the stepping of the people provided a driving frequency that was close to the natural frequency of the bridge. This resulted in a maximum energy transfer and increased amplitude of the oscillations of the bridge. Now, in this case, it was not but it terrified the people on the bridge and was quite an expensive. It's only open for one day. They had to close it and then they added lots of damping and equipment to this bridge to stop it from happening. Another example over here is this car. And this is just to highlight that engineers spend an absolute fortune and a huge amount of time trying to avoid resonance. Because in a car, and different parts of the car will have different natural frequencies. And it's hard to predict exactly what driving frequencies the bits of the car will experience. Because the driving frequency in this case would be due to driving across, say, a rough road. And the vibrations from the road provide this driving frequency. And it's just so happened that that driving frequency is close to the natural frequency of, say, the dashboard. So the dashboard, because of the maximum energy transfer, has increased amplitude oscillations, causing the rattle. And again, this isn't dangerous, but it does cause irritation. And just for completion, we've got someone on a swing again. And this person on the swing, well, they're being pushed at a frequency that's close to the natural frequency of the swing. You get a maximum um, energy transfer, they get increased amplitude swings. Now in this case, again, not really dangerous, but that person is a little bit scared. What I'm trying to highlight here is that every time resonance comes up, you pretty much just have to quote, when the driving frequency is close to the natural frequency, maximum energy transfer occurs, you get an increased amplitude, um, etc straightforward. The only other bit that you need to be able to talk about is what a graph of amplitude against frequency would look like, where frequency is the driving frequency. And really what we're saying here is that, well, you have a system that's maybe vibrating a little bit, small amplitude oscillations, and whatever the driving frequency is, it doesn't really have much impact except for when the drill is close to the natural frequency. And then you get this sudden peak. And you have to be very careful when you draw this. The peak has to be very narrow. Um, you do want concave little sides here and a tight convex end at the end there. And you need to be familiar with this and you need to be able to draw it. I've just included over at the side here um, some examples of where people might go wrong. This person, it's not this person, it's me, uh, I have drawn this, where it's a bit too rounded, and that wouldn't gain credit in an exam. And again, here, this one, it's just got a sudden right angles. Again, that wouldn't cause credit as well, or gain credit, sorry. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, Sorry about all these cut out bits of paper. This is the second time I've had to do this because the recording went wrong. Okay, have a good day. Goodbye.